everyone. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Lane Strathern, who is the co-director of the newly established Hawkeye Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. <laughs> and, I know, that's why I have to refer to my paper here, because I don't think I could remember all that. And um, Lane's just going to share with us a little bit about uh, this new research center and this Baby Steps app that he has created. So Lane, if you could um, share with us a little bit about how the need for the research center was identified and the process that it took to where it is today. Sure, well, thank you for inviting me to chat with you and great to get to know you and your students a little bit today. So first off, I'm a developmental pediatrician. So I see children in clinic who have a broad range of developmental disabilities, ranging from autism and attention deficit disorder through to more behavioral uh, problems, aggressive and uh, challenging behavior, and then genetic syndromes. So somewhere between neurology, psychiatry is uh, the field of developmental pediatrics. And of course, like any area of, of study, there are lots of unanswered questions. And uh, so we're, we're involved in, in research uh, um, involving children, families uh, that, that, that have these developmental disabilities. But sort of in a parallel to that, there is a, um, many researchers in the basic science field that are doing animal models, for example, um, basic genetic studies from worms to rodents to uh, chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's been uh, a challenge for these two diverse groups sometimes to communicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, I know this is the same in many academic fields. Sometimes we, we speak a different language. Okay, and uh, the, the sort of terminology that we're using, the experiences that we, we have, may be very different from these other groups of researchers. But we certainly recognize how critical that communication is. And in the past, there have been a lot of barriers um, in helping these two groups to work together for the benefit of children and families who have who experience these disabilities every day of their lives. So when I first came to Iowa about six years ago, I became aware of this grant opportunity uh, through the National Institutes of Health to establish a research center uh, for intellectual, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And one of the main goals of these research centers, which are established around the country, there's around 15 centers at different uh, universities around the country. One of the main goals was to help facilitate this communication between basic and clinical researchers so that we could really advance the field. And so uh, I started putting out my feelers among my mm -hmm. colleagues in the clinical research field and in the basic sciences. Uh, Ted Abel and I made some connections. T Ted is the director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, uh, which predominantly focuses on basic science research. And um, we just worked really hard, established a, a fantastic team of investigators and uh, worked towards putting this, um, this grant submission together. And the first time we weren't successful, but we turned it around in a few months and our second submission was successfully funded, which means that uh, we are awarded around $6.2 million over a five year period. Um, to establish this center at the University of Iowa and to help facilitate uh, more research, more focused and more um, effective research, bringing these two groups together. And we've called it the Hawk IDDRC. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're... Um... Your second grant submission was uh, successful because this sounds like it is just such a, a beneficial um, um, center to have in our community. And 
Um, one thing that I'd like to know a little bit more about this Baby Steps app that you created for the smartphone to help uh, families at home kind of monitor the progress of their child? Sure. So as part of this research center, they give funding for one specific project that utilizes all of the resources from the different cores. So it funds a specific cores to support research in this area. One is a, a genetics core. One is a neuroimaging and behavior core. One is what's called a clinical translational core. And then there's an administrative core. So we developed a research project, sort of like a, a prototype project mm. that would utilize these uh, services um, and be an example for other, other studies throughout the institution. Uh, and this particular study was um, designed to look for early uh, epigenetic markers for autism. Okay, so there's been a lot of work on the genetics of autism, genes that may increase or decrease risk for autism. And um, we've also come to realize that there's, there must be more to autism than the genetics of autism. There must be other environmental factors that may be contributing as well. And so epigenetics is um, a study of factors, chemical factors that change how genes work. So they attach to the genome and affect whether genes are turned on or off or whether they're upregulated, meaning that they work harder or slowed down. And the, the um, interesting thing about these epigenetic markers is that they can be modified by the environment in which they find themselves in. So um, this study lo is looking at how a child's social experience and social environment may um, contribute to some, some of the risk related to the development of autism. And that's where the, the smartphone app comes in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Took a while to get there, but... Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. It's good to have that background information. Yeah. So we've developed a research app that is very simple to use, very user-friendly. That is something that is, we hope is very engaging for families, that they get something out of it as well as contributing to research. And it's an, an, it's an app that uh, families can use in their home environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges with um, clinical research is, you know, you bring children into this unfamiliar, sterile hospital environment, and sometimes they don't act the same as when they're at home. <laughs> So the benefit of the smartphone app is that families can, can use their, their smartphone to do what every parent does, and that's videotape their kids, mm -hmm. so that we have this record of social experience, social development, social functioning in a non-threatening environment at home. And of course, we're asking family members to complete questionnaires and report how things are going from day to day at home. So they may just get a notification on their phone saying, how stressed are you feeling right now? And then by the one tap, and they've responded on a one to five scale of how stressed they're feeling at that moment in time. And then of course, over weeks and months, we get a, a more complete picture of what's happening in the home environment, how stressed, how whether there's mental health challenges, whether there's other struggles that families may be going through that, that may affect um, child development as well. So that's how we're utilizing the app and it's called Baby Steps um, to look for stepwise development of, of these children. And then the epigenetic part is we've got approval from the Iowa Department of Public Health to access these children's newborn blood spots. So there's every child that's born has a blood test taken to screen for a variety of different conditions. And it's collected on a little um, cardboard square. And after they've taken their sample to do their testing, the rest of the sample is stored for five years uh, in the state hygienics lab, which is run by the University of Iowa. So we've got permission to access that blood spot 
and then compare it with the blood sample that we take at the time of diagnosis to see if these epigenetic markers are changing across time and how that may be related to uh, experiential factors at home. And then of course, we also compare the genetic markers that are, uh, oftentimes are transmitted from parent to, to child to see if that risk and the uh, epigenetic risk might, might be intersecting. That's fascinating. Um, I, I do have a follow-up question because you said, you know, it's primarily used in the home environment. Um, what is the age range for these children? Because I'm wondering if it would be an opportunity in the future to also monitor them in an academic, in a school environment as well, or is it just for the, um, the younger ones that may not be in school yet? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. This particular study is, is just looking at children around the time of diagnosis between the ages of two and three years. Okay, so. But there's incredible opportunities there to continue to collect data as children get older and uh, are enrolled in school. So most of these children end up in a preschool program when they're three, and that continues on into kindergarten and elementary school. Uh, in fact, University College London is collaborating with us because when they heard about our app, they were very excited and they had a, a funding opportunity to work with their Department of Education to look at early predictors of learning and educational outcomes. So we're modifying the Baby Steps app for their particular study and they'll be collecting data into the school, school years as well. So, uh... Ultimately, yeah. Ultimately, our, our most important goal is to look uh, right back into pregnancy, to have pregnant women uh, download the app and, and provide data on things that are happening during pregnancy and, and birth complications and uh, then early factors from infancy onto um, age two or three. And then we can really get a... a, a, a unbiased look at some of the factors early on in development that might be contributing to risk. So that, that's where we're headed next. So, I mean, I know that you stated you're still in the, the early process of this research, but, you know, from a bigger picture, what do you see as the implications for your results? Is it more to um, with special attention to, you know, the early life course and looking at maybe some of the social determinants that are impacting um, these children and their families to do some type of early intervention, possibly. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate goal. Is it? Okay. <laughs> I, I think yeah. um, a lot of times, especially in the medical profession, we tackle what we see in front of us. Okay, our, our families, the patients come, we see them in clinic, they have challenges, they have uh, needs that, that, that have to be met. And so that's our focus of attention is what we see in front of us right now. But as you can imagine, these challenges are really, really difficult uh, to provide help and support for. Um, you know, a child who has autism is in need of very specialized and intensive uh, interventions, both therapy and educational supports. And those, those needs don't just go away. Oftentimes they continue into childhood, adolescence and adulthood. Um, so if, if we could understand uh, where some of these needs are coming from and perhaps even um, uh, identify things that we could do differently, even back into pregnancy and early childhood, that could help alleviate some of this, uh, some of these these challenges. Then, how much more productive and more uh, cost effective our efforts would be? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That that just sounds amazing. Um. Well, I know. Um, We've been talking quite a bit, but I don't know if you have a few minutes to, you know, talk about 
Are there any type of community education or any type of outreach that you're doing as a part of this research? Um, right, so that, that's another goal we have for the Hawk IDDRC is to what we call disseminate research into the community. Um, again, a lot of times because of these communication barriers, not just within the field, but between researchers and the community, we don't do a very good job of explaining what we're doing and the results of our research and, and how that could impact uh, individuals and families in, in the community. So that's another goal is to um, form alliances with families and uh, organizations who are working in the community with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, and that's where Derek Willis and the, the USED come into it. Uh, Derek is the director of the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, which is housed here in the Center for Disabilities and Development where I work. And their goal is to um, support uh, organizations in the community that provide uh, help for families such as uh, education, housing, transportation, very practical issues uh, that support the IDD community. <clears throat> and so we're working with Derek uh, and his team that are scattered throughout Iowa at various locations uh, so that we can uh, help provide education and also receive feedback from the people who are actually on the ground working with, with these families on what, what sort of questions are the most important to ask. Uh, it's great to do research and ask questions, but if your questions aren't important, then the answers aren't really important either. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And it's really the individuals that are affected by this that, that have the most important questions to ask. So again, it's building communications, overcoming these barriers of communication, both within the field and between the research community and, the, and society in general. Well, I just wanna thank you so very much uh, for your time and talking about the center and um, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.